Welcome back to Getting Past the Premium, everybody. I am here with a good friend of mine, a stalwart in the industry, Larry Linney. How you doing, buddy? Well, that right there threw me off. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that, I might get you with that one. I'm not sure if that means I'm old or... Oh, no, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> Take it how you well, want, Larry, but that is not how it was intended. Well, no. <laughs> well, I am old, so that's okay. Maybe, yeah. maybe my uh, being old has some wisdom. We'll see. There you go. Well... On that note, give everybody kind of the who you are, your background a bit, um, because I think it's important we frame that in to get into our discussion today. Yeah, I I think as little as I can uh, to to allow us to get to the to the more important topics today. But yeah, I'm Larry Lenny. I'm Insight Performance Group CEO. Um, We're a a team of eight advisors that work in the insurance industry. We work with um, insurance agencies and some insurance companies and. uh, helping them work on their business so that they can be more effective working in the business. Uh, We've got clients throughout the U.S. and Canada. Uh, We've had clients in Latin America as well. And um, again, it's everything, every problem that insurance agencies deal with, um, we study, dive in, uh, fix, create intellectual property, and help our clients have speed at getting through those problems. So that's what we do. And I came from selling insurance in my early part of my career. So I, I get it. I do it. As a matter of fact, I actually helped a client sell a, a deal uh, just a couple of, a, a few weeks ago. And uh, so I stay active in the game. And so do all of our, all of our advisors. We stay very active inside of insurance agency work. Yeah, for sure. And you're being slightly modest because you guys do some of what I would consider some of the most forward thinking work in the industry about where are we going? How do, you know, what do agencies need to do to get there? And I think that our discussion today, which I'm super pumped about, is going to show that of just you guys thinking about where do we need to go next? And that's, you know, that topic is I've ran into it a lot as as we're talking to to firms and agencies about launch and how can they implement a new software tool. Um, you know, we get hit with all of these things out there right nowadays, right? Especially now that, and I know we're going to talk about it, but the advent of AI is like, now what do I do with all this, right? The speed of change is not slowing down. And it's very easy to think that we can bring on a tool. We can, you know, do this change, add this person or whatnot, and that's going to make everything easier or better or different, right? And in reality, without very solid systems around execution, it's just going to add complexity to our business and make things almost worse, right? So give me your thoughts around this, you know, issue and opportunity around execution in insurance agencies right now. Uh, so Elliot, you know, I was, I was interviewed for a book um, that's going to be coming out here in the, in the near future. And uh, in that book, uh, they were asking me, what I thought was just overall success in life and some of the key things and, you know, define what you think about, you know, how people do things. And, and uh, the, the key topic that I introduced into that, into this book that's being written was that I think there's really two kinds of people. Uh, there's people that will um, take ideas and um, passion and interest and strategy, and they go figure out a way to execute at the highest level. And then there are people that will decide to do things and then do nothing with it. (laughs) And I think that comes to the the reality here. I think our industry has a major problem of they're they're not short of ideas and they're not short of passion and they're not short of hearing best practices and thinking, "I, I want that. I want a new sales system or I want a new software or technology or we want to cross sell or we want strategy is not lacking. People have all the ideas where we have a problem in this industry is, is people lack the discipline to execute the quality of a strategy. They'll partially execute and get partial results. And Mm. quite honestly, I find that this industry allows partial results to be a sedative to moving forward to greater success. They say, wow, look at that. We got a little results. And then they move on to something else. And so, Elliot, I mean, agencies across uh, the U.S., Canada, every agency I work with has this problem at some level that they just don't have the disciplines to do things that are uncomfortable, do things that are hard. They do the easy stuff, but they won't push through the hard things and hold people accountable to execute strategies at levels that will get them the greatest results. Yeah, and I think, you know, as you're uh, framing that in, it's, I want to go to kind of why you feel like that is because it's, it certainly isn't that we, 
you know, don't want to have higher results. I think most of the people, particularly that you're working with, want to, you know, continue to grow their business and they mm -hmm. want to push to the next level and, you know, all of those things. But we get caught in that trap of, I think you're right, like you see partial results and you think it's, you know, in the right spot, you know, you kind of see that, sh that, that jump up right away. And then it starts to fade down and that's where your systems come in. And that's, what's going to keep that trajectory going is your systems around execution. But, but why do people fall off there? What's, you know, what's the issue there that's causing that? Gosh, Elliot, this is a, this could be a whole session <laughs> on just the psychology of human beings. Yeah. And, you know, the, the reality, I, my, my wife and I were just talking, she's, she's doing a bunch of nursing work right now as, as a, uh, as a student and she was working at a mental hospital. And, you know, I, I was asking her questions about, you know, why do people get get kind of caught up into these mental um, issues and problems? And, and one of the conclusions, I think there's a lot of other things I don't know, but one of the conclusions is they were never given the tools mm -hmm. to be able to solve problems, to yeah. the tools to deal with issues in their life. They, they don't have the tools to to get through tough things. And for whatever reasons they have, well, let's go to the insurance industry. I think it's the same thing here. Uh, I think people lack project management skills. I think they lack the understanding of how to push through difficult issues and, and uncomfortable situations and organizations. I think they have a difficulty in leadership and management of personnel to get them to do things that they expect them to do. And so they take the path of least resistance. And, you know, Elliot, this is a, a, a theme that I could say I, I've been bouncing on and teaching a lot of lately, and I'll probably run this through the end of my career. And that is that, you know, when, whenever you're put in a place where you don't have to do something, meaning life or death, um, it's always just a nice to have that when we're working towards things like that, that feel good, that's something I'd like to have, uh, there's usually something difficult that's going to get in our way. But if like to have, and it's feel just, just a, a positive thing, and there's no really negative consequence, there's no real harsh fear of loss, what's going to happen is I'm going to seek comfort every time it gets hard. Yep. Anytime it gets hard, I'm going to find comfort. And I'm going to say, yeah, I'm going to do what's easy. Or, oh, I'm going to let the salespeople dilute the sales system. Oh, I'm going to let the, 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 the team say they're, oh, they're too busy to do this or whatever. And so people will allow that going to comfort, they'll allow it to happen because again, they don't have the tools. They don't know what tools to use to stay disciplined to strategy, to have tactical plans, to do project management, to have tough-minded leadership, to execute, um, to train appropriately, to help people buy into concepts. You know, like give me an example of that, Elliot. You know, we've been teaching different sales systems and, you know, we're, we're big believers in more conceptual ideology in sales. Um, and we'll let people execute a lot of different ways. But we actually had a group of, of sales mastery people come in one time and we took them through all of the philosophies of sales and said, do you believe in these things? And everyone of them said, absolutely. Then we said, OK, now let's talk about your sales system. <laughs> and each one of them had their own model and every one of them had diluted what they said they believed in. And so then we brought this tool out that said, OK, here's a step that psychologically business that 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 from a, a behavioral science standpoint says, this will be effective for this reason. And the person has said, I don't do that because I was uncomfortable with it or that didn't fit my style. But they just diluted it. And they just said, I'm not gonna do it. And now we pushed them back and said, but, but it'll help you sell more. What if you had to do it? How could you do it? And we got, in a lot of cases, they'd say, well, you know what? I don't need that because I have other things that fix that. Awesome, don't do it. But that's a good reason. Yeah. And then others would go, I don't really have a good reason and I'm missing that. And that's probably impacting my sales. Now I've got to go do tough things. That means I have to learn more, be intellectually curious. I have to train more. I have to practice more. I have to get in front of people and look stupid internally so that I don't look stupid externally. And then they all of a sudden got that and their increased sales. But they didn't, all they all did initially was went, I don't get it. I don't want it. I'm not comfortable. I'm not going to do it. Well, therefore, solution. So again, it's the lack of tools, Elliot. It's just not having the skills or the tools necessary and even all the way to the leadership skills necessary to stick to the discipline of quality execution and strategy. Yeah. And I don't know if, if you would agree or disagree with this. One of the things that I've found over time is it seems like our industry, the natural progression, right, as you start in some sort of a role inside the organization, so sales or you know, on the service team as a, as a leader, and you start to work your way into leadership. And so many folks that are 
in a leadership role, leading a sales team, or you know, maybe they're driving the sales process, the sales system. They are also selling and operating and, and managing a book, right? And I've found kind of to your comfort comment that I I'll hear comments of like, I just can't get these these people to do it. You know, I just don't I just don't understand why. But the instead of going to the the leadership tactics of how do I manage and lead people, it's I'm just going to go sell more in my book because that's what I'm used to. That's what I'm comfortable with. That's what I know how to do. And everybody else should just keep doing this. I've already taught them it. You know, they know how to do it. It's just, it's on them. And, but there's frustration there because people aren't doing it. And that's really a leadership issue. But I, I wonder if there's not some, some of that dichotomy that does impact our industry where we have these competing roles essentially where, which I do think it's important to, like you said, we're, uh, at Insight, you guys are active in the sales game. I think it's important as a leader to be active with your team and, and you know, manage a, some clients and things like that. So you're, you keep your saw sharp, but you got to find that balance of being a leader versus operating your book. I'm just curious how much you feel like that fits into this particular conversation. Yeah, just a, a little a little connection of a couple of things. So the, first of all, you know, Daniel Kahneman, um, author of Thinking Fast and Slow, he's a he's a Pulitzer Prize winner in his concept of behavioral science around the fear of loss versus the potential of gain, and that people will act and execute two to one over uh, ha by having a fear of loss versus a potential of gain. The problem in the insurance industry is the losses that we have by not executing are not clear. That's not execute. It's not identified today. You know, yeah. if I don't make a sales call today, I don't feel the loss today. I feel the loss down the road when my mm -hmm. book's not bigger, but I don't feel the loss today. And I don't feel the ur the sense of urgency around loss. But I, but I have this potential of gain. I've had that'd be nice, but that's not a driver of performance. So that's part of what's going on here. And then to your point, the leadership, um, everybody is busy. Everybody is busy working in the business. Again, that's the reason Insight exists is everybody's so busy working in the business, they don't have time to work on the business. Now, mm -hmm. I would I would argue they do have time, they just need to learn how to manage their time more effectively. They need to get disciplines around that. They need, and what Insight has done is we've created speed in execution around those things because we realize that, that reality. But leadership has typically not been trained on project management. And yeah. they've not been trained on uh, behavioral management of how do I get change to take place in an organization? And, you know, I hear the questions all the time. I, I, I've got producers or I've got uh, managers that they're either too busy or um, they don't want to do this or they've got their own ideas. And so, you know, I can't make them change. Well, that's right. If you want to be a command and control manager, you're probably right. Mm -hmm. If you want to be a leader, there's ways to get there. Leaders sell people, they convince people, and they create energy around it. And they create more of the clarity of the, uh, and bring up to, to light the sense of urgency around the fear of loss. And they're, ex they're, bringing, they're bringing leadership skills to the table um, that will get them across the finish line. And, and, you know, I think at some point during this, this interview, we'll get to the place where uh, I've, I've got the, the six different things I think will get mm -hmm. us to that execution level and what leaders need to be doing. Uh, but the bottom line is, I, I don't think it's bad intent. I don't think people yeah. are bad. I think they get to comfort because it's easier. I think they take the path of least resistance. I think easy is what the world always tends to go to. But Elliot, at the end of the day, easy and comfort ultimately will end up in a much harder hard. Harder to change later on. Harder to deal with not having growth. Harder to deal with the failures that might come to us that aren't really in our face today. They're going to show up eventually. And what happens when competition does take artificial intelligence to another level? What happens when they do get their, their producers to be high level business acumen, committed to intellectual curiosity and learning? And all of a sudden, these people can run these tools. And, you know, we talked about this in prep for this. But, you know, to me, I think things like launch, uh, I think a lot of great products exist out there that are phenomenal. But the problem is these are mastery level tools that create high level consulting capabilities for the client. 
we don't have the operators for it. Yeah. Because what we're doing is we're taking a salesperson that's not been intellectually curious, that's not been doing their business acumen development, that has not been growing and creating a consulting nature, and they're in, they're just an insurance professional. And we're telling them to go operate this piece of machinery that they don't know how to operate. Yeah. And that's what's got to change is we have to start working on the discipline of changing people. Elliot, the number of times I've seen insurance agencies spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on software and systems and have put marginal efforts at training their people. They'll go do a single training session and say, here's, here's hundreds of thousands, potentially million dollars over time, millions of dollars over time committed to something. And yet they do a one day training session, no follow up, no accountability, no parameters put in place, no guardrails, just now it's on you. What do you think the chance of success is? Yeah, we lack totally. the discipline and the tools. Well, this is, it's going to, well, first off, so I took that note and I hope everybody caught that comfort leads to a much harder hard in the future. I thought that was, that was awesome. I wanted to highlight that, but I think this is going to become more of an issue too, Larry, as I think about the future where we're going to have to bring in quote unquote green people into our industry across the board. Uh, whether it's sales, whether it's service, whether it's anywhere, and be able to effectively train them, which is not traditionally what our agency has been good at or at the independent agency level, right? Carriers and, you know, the large nationals and things, they have training programs. They have people set up to do that. We aren't going to be able to rely on pulling those people away forever, right? Um, so we are going to have to be, have a much uh, clearer focus around training our people. But um I do want to get to your kind of keys to success here around what are the strategies? So, so we've kind of highlighted this problem around execution and what it's costing us as, as firms, right. Or what it could be costing us, but what, so, so if I'm a leader of an organization, what can I be doing? What are the strategies you'd recommend I do in order to set these systems up in order to get better at this execution? Yeah, I, I, I've been you know thinking through this and working through this for months, if not years, because it's it's a lot of who I am, and I think what's made Insight so successful is is our ability to have the disciplines of execution. And so I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna lay out six. Are they perfect? I don't know. Are they gonna continue <laughs> to evolve? Yes, I can promise you they will. But let me give you six that I think are are things that maybe our listeners out there today can can come to some conclusions that uh, yeah I can get there. So the first thing I would tell you is is building a culture and building a belief system about whatever you're doing before you start delivering process. And so what I mean by that is many times we as leaders put all the effort, energy into learning about and developing and coming up with ideas. And then we go out and tell our people to go execute this new tool and this new process. And, and the reason we bought into it is because, you know, when I say culture, I'm talking about beliefs and behaviors that are normal. So when I believe in something, because I've been educated about it, understand it, I get it. And I've got a whole belief and, and, and an understanding of behaviors of what it's going to take to make this successful. Um, but then I don't tell my people that and they're not getting the benefit of that. They don't have the, the same passion I have. They don't have the yeah. same reason. So we need to spend, and, and my belief is if you go buy a piece of software, if you go build a new strategy or come up with a new strategic design, you need to spend two or three months speaking to your people with language, uh, getting them to understand why we need something, what it is that we're thinking about. How could we fix our world today? How can your life be better? And what I have found is that when you get to a place of getting people to start asking you for the tool, that's when you've got your place in the right spot in your organization, the right spot for a strategy. So I'll give you a great example of this. When I first came into this industry, I used to take sales systems out to clients and say, let me show you the coolest sales system in the world. And when they saw me or some of my partners communicating and delivering it, everybody in the room was like, oh my gosh, that's awesome. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. Wow, that's so cool. Because they would see us delivering at that level. Well, then we leave and they've got it. <laughs> yeah. And they start trying it and looking at it. And all they do is start criticizing the tools. Well, I don't like this tool. I don't like that question. I don't like this. I don't like the way that works. I'm like, and they just dilute, 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 dilute. So I did this for years and I would go back to agencies and find out very few people were executing. So here's what I did different. Today, when somebody says, we want to work with you on sales, 
we will spend two or three months talking about why. We'll talk about intellectual property selling. We'll talk about um, uh, in, in training, get people believing in the concepts around um, how powerful it is to be an advisor, a consultant. What are you advising on? Why do you need it? What, and we keep pushing all the way through to about three months down the road. Sometimes it takes up to six months. And then they go, well, we can't do those things because we don't have the tools. Oh, oh, you mean like these tools? And then we give them the tools and then they want them and they're not criticizing. Now they want to use them. So I think the, I think step one is building a culture and building belief systems before you deliver a change and deliver. So you want to go cross-sell? Don't go out and give them a cross-selling strategy and tell them to go execute it. Spend time talking about belief systems and strategies and, and what do we believe about cross-selling? How can we do that? How does the model work to get buyers to believe in it? Because I, I tell you right now, if you just put a, a list of people that you've got to go call, here's what's going to happen. Producers are going to call and say, hey, uh, you want to you, you wanna see our benefits team? You want to talk to anybody? Do you, you want to, you know, we do benefits. I mean, things like that's going to happen and the client's going to say, no, we're good. And you're not going to get any cross sell. And it's because yeah. you didn't create a belief system. You didn't create behaviorals. You didn't create agreements on how we're going to do things to get them excited about it and then say, give me the list. <laughs> when yeah. they're asking for it, now you got this. So that's number one is get culture and beliefs before you start delivering processes and tools. That has to happen or it won't be executed. All right. Second thing I would tell you is when you're building strategy. So whatever it is, a strategic initiative, a new market niche, um, a, a strategy of people change and restructure of an organization, a strategy of executing a new sales system. I don't care what it is. You've got to sit down as a leadership team and think through what will be the most uncomfortable, difficult, possible things that are going to happen in this process. What's going to be the biggest barriers to success? What are going to be the biggest challenges? Where are people going to fight us? Where are we going to have... Um, um, uncomfortable elements in the process of change. And you've got to build in execution strategies and tactics of how are you going to address those? When are you going to address them? And how are you going to overcome them? And you got to track and monitor that on a regular basis and have disciplines around sticking to that. Because otherwise, if you don't have a plan, when the uncomfortable arrives, you're going to let people go to comfort and you're going to fail. Number three, I would say that leaders have to have boundaries on what's acceptable and what's not within a strategy. We are in an independent insurance agency world, Elliot. I, I mean, independents are going to do it their way. <laughs> and, and we want people to have freedom to be themselves and be flexible and be bring their own initiatives and creativity. I want that. But what we want to do is create boundaries of what we agree upon are the standards of our business. So again, even with launch, I might say, look, I don't expect somebody to use every single tactical detail of launch, but I might say we're going to use launch on every prospect. Or I might say we're going to deliver plans to every prospect um, and then just create a parameter of what that looks like, of what's, a, what's, a, what's a possible. Now, that gives people flexibility within the framework. Yeah. But within the framework, there's certain things that are just standards. And when I ran sales at an insurance agency, I told everybody there's three steps in our process that are non-negotiable. We will do these three steps because that's a standard of who we are as a company. It's part of our brand. These three steps are deliverables that we're committing to our clients. And we will do those. Now, here's some tools to do each of the three. Yeah. And if you have a different idea, bring it to me. And if I prove it, I, I got to give you approval, but if I approve it, we'll do it. And by the end of the day, I, I, over a couple of year period, we had about five different ways to do step one, five different ways to, or 10 different ways to do step two. And we had about three different ways to do step three, but all three fell within the parameters that I, we agreed upon, but I gave the flexibility. So set boundaries on what's acceptable. Otherwise they're going to take the path of least resistance, the most comfortable way and they're going to dilute the heck out of it, okay? Number four is clarity of expectations must be set. So what will you expect from people? Do you expect them to put time into training? Do you expect them to be able to role play and practice and show that they can execute? Do you expect them to get certified in something? Do you expect 
uh, them to put teamwork time into developing a cross-selling strategy? Do you expect whatever the expectations are that you know are necessary to be successful? Define them, put them in place and hold people accountable to it. Without the expectations, again, people are going to have the freedom to give excuses and reasons why they're doing other things, or you might even not, you might not even know that they're doing what they're doing. Number five is frequent training. And, you know, one thing that I learned years ago in my strategic coach program is that language drives culture. So the more you talk about something, the more that's what you become. Go look at your sports teams, your family, anywhere in life, even in your business today. The things you've talked about the most, that's who you are. So when you build new strategy, you got to talk about it a bunch. You got to keep reminding people often. This is a leadership role. Leadership must keep going over it and over it and over it. And back to your comment earlier that when, an organization, as an example, has a sales system that they, they they buy into, and then the leader never does anything else with it. That's you, you got to be the one that's leading the charge of knowing it the best, understanding it the best, talking about it the most, giving examples. And so frequency of training allows language to be frequent and purposeful and disciplined that we just keep talking about and talking about it. And you, we all know, everybody on this, listening to this podcast today can tell you the number of times in their life that, that they say, oh, I went through this training or we did this thing. And all of a sudden, one day the light came on. Mm -hmm. Well, the light came on because the language was frequent. Yep. It's not because you just woke up one day and the light came on. The light comes on because of frequency and eventually the right words, the right way at the right time show up. And now you're ready to learn. So training has to be built in and systematic and not a one-time event. Um, number six is check-ins and one-on-ones. Because the other thing that has to happen with almost all strategies of organizations is that we're dealing with a lot of individuals that are very different. And if you try to herd cats and say, I'm going to do one thing to get everybody down the road, it ain't going to happen. Yeah. Everybody's going to have their own personal excuse. Everybody's going to have their own personal issues. Everybody's going to have their own personal biases that they're working through to learn. Um, and if you can check in one-on-one -on -one and start being custom problem solving to individuals, that's when you're going to move the needle is help each person with their own issues around execution and performance and getting to an outcome. And so if we break this down to one-on-one -on -one feedback and accountability and, and support and helping them and training, then you're going to finally start getting to where you're going to see more and more of the adoption and more and more of the success take place. At the end of the day, we got to stop spending millions of dollars on software, strategy, and systems and allowing 25% execution. That's just, that's just ridiculous. And if you want to be a company in the future in the insurance agency world that will dominate, again, with AI coming, it's here, <laughs> um, yeah. with with uh, the consultative world being challenged and pushed even more so, with the, the needs that clients are going to have around risk and risk strategies and risk, risk identification, with all of these things that are coming, you know, the people that are executors are going to be the winners. The people with ideas and best practices, they're going to be the bottom feeders. We might have enough cash flow to keep them in business. Yeah. We may not. We may not. And we are already, I mean, I don't know if you noticed this, but one of the things that has been identified um, is that this is the first time that we, anybody that's been in the financial side of this business, the first time in the history, um, known history, so let's say 40, 50 years, that we have seen a separation in valuations. Companies that are larger, that are executing, that are changing, that are doing all these right things, do you know their values are actually increasing? We're now seeing people offering lower values for companies wow. that do not. Smaller companies, Which not growing, sense. not having niche areas. We are, see, I mean, in the past, it's always, here's the valuation model. You know, you're valued at this because you're valued at this because that's the industry. Now, granted, there was things about growth and other things that would go off of that. But there is a, there is a clear dropping of values of companies that don't have something that shows a big time future. Yeah. And the companies that do, they're continuing to grow the value. So I think it's a I think it's an early shot across the bow that if you're not executing, you may you may decrease the value of your company. So wow, yeah, there you go.
That's crazy. The, I mean, I, I didn't want to interrupt you going through those. Cause I think that they're, they're fantastic. Um, it's a, that's a blueprint to, to this execution that, you know, anybody can take out of this and develop. But I, the main thing I, I want to hit on there, uh, is none of this is easy, right? It is going to be difficult. It is hard. Um, now I would argue you put the time and the energy and the effort in and you do it right. You can create a system that isn't difficult, that isn't hard, but you are going to have to do difficult things and different things. And you're going to have to evolve. And I think it's very easy in our industry, particularly if, you know, we, we've gotten to that point of we've built a book or we've built, you know, a decent uh, team under us or whatever that is kind of just, it's just humming, you know, it's just going in our industry. If you're bad, you can renew 90% of your business every year, you know? So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it, you can get comfortable. And I, I do, I want to highlight that in there that it, all of those strategies that you laid out are not silver bullets. There is no silver bullet, right? It's going to take the work in order to get the get you in a spot that you're going to be able to execute on these things. But I love that you brought up that valuation piece at the end because we're now seeing in the market that the market is responding to this type of an issue more than it ever has or yeah, never has in the past, right? And so it's very real that this is going to not only cost you money, it's going to cost you value, but it's also going to co start costing you people and time. And cause, cause the, the heart is going to get harder in the future if we stay in this, this area of comfort. And so I think it's, we we've been, you've been preaching this Larry. We've, we've talked about it forever that you ha we have to continue to grow and evolve if we're going to stay ahead of the industry. Right. Um, but, but there hasn't ever been this level of, of direct, you know, response from the industry. It seems like, because we're going to have to continue to evolve in order to stay ahead of, of the trends. Elliot, spot on. And, you know, just to give you another example, you know, I think we do need tools. I mean, think people are going to need yeah. project management tools. Um, but here's a great example. I bet more than half of the people that I show them some of our very sophisticated and quality project management tools that we've used. And I've said, this is how we manage those. And you know what I hear? I hear the clients that I talk to say, yeah, no, that's, that's just too detailed for us. I'm like, <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's hard. You're right. You're going to have to change your culture a little bit to actually put together detailed plans and actually have accountability to stay on top of that. But the answer is all right out of the shoot. Oh my gosh. I don't know that we could ever do that. That's hard. Yep. There you go. Yeah. It goes right back to it. And you know, it, 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 in the, in this, this author that um, asked me to, to have a chapter in this book about uh, the two kinds of people um, it's Patrick Sitkins, by the way, it's uh, and, and mm -hmm. the book's going to be coming out soon, but um, you know, I tell the story in the book that that's a, it's a, it's an old um, uh, fabled uh, parable. And it says, you know, there's five birds on a, on a wire and three of them decide to fly off. How many are left? The answer is five. Because deciding to fly off doesn't get you off the wire. It's doing something. And that's really the difference is there's a lot of people that make decisions on strategy. They make decisions on stuff they need to do. They want to do something. They like an idea. But the execution of acting is so hard. And it does take a discipline. And it's and you've got to push through the hard parts. And you've got to find things that maybe you say, that's very uncomfortable. It's, Larry, it's really uncomfortable for me to do disciplined project management, then the answer is go hire a project manager or go find somebody in your organization that has project management skills, elevate them into a role that they are going to be your project manager yeah. and get a project management software and build out the system and have accountability. And maybe that's the hard that you have to get through to see results out of the money you're spending. Absolutely. Well, awesome, man. That's a, a master class there. I hope everybody goes back and re-listens to a couple pieces of this because um, this is one of, I think, the the biggest issues that the industry faces right now and also our biggest opportunity to continue to grow and evolve and build value in our organizations. And so appreciate your time, man. Thank you so much. I, I know everybody took a lot out of this and it's good to see you again. It's always fun hanging out with you. And one thing that I'll I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a, a kudos is just watching what you and your firm has done over the last 10 years now. Um, you're one of the best at execution. And I know a lot of it's because of you. You you are a, a 
you're an execution guy. So I'm, I'm going to, mm-hmm. I'm going to go ahead and throw that out there that uh, you're, you're top 10% in the people that I work with and the companies that we work with, as far as uh, you get things across the finish line, you guys do a great job of it. So I know you felt pretty comfortable through this conversation. <laughs> yeah. Well, it always could be better, Larry. Always could be better. <laughs> that's, I appreciate That's going to get us there. Well, thanks for letting me participate. Love this, love this podcast. You guys are doing a great job and uh, let's go keep changing the industry. Sounds good, man. Talk soon. All right, buddy. Be well.